Got any questions for me? JM is the key. This is John Mendoza and welcome to my vlog. Dyspnea. It is a subjective experience of breathing discomfort that consists of qualitative distinct sensations that vary in intensity. This can be perceived only by the person experiencing it and therefore must be self-reported. However, clinicians may measure and report increased work of breathing by looking for signs such as tachypnea, accessory muscle use, and intercostal retraction. Dyspnea is a common and has been a frequent cause for emergency room visits. This has a prevalence of up to 13% in the community that increases up to as high as 37% for adults aged 70 years old and above. The mechanisms underlying dyspnea are complex as it can arise from different contributory respiratory sensations such as chest tightness or air hunger. It arises from a variety of pathways including generation of afferent signals from the respiratory system to the central nervous system, efferent signals from the central nervous system back to the respiratory muscles, and particularly when there is a mismatch in the integrative signaling between the two pathways, and this is termed efferent reafferent mismatch. The afferent signals trigger the CNS and include primarily peripheral chemoreceptors in the carotid and aortic arc and central chemoreceptors in the medulla that are both activated by hypoxemia, hypercapnia, or acidemia and might produce a sense of air hunger. Next are the mechanoreceptors in the upper airways, lungs including stretch receptors, irritant receptors and J-receptors, and chest wall including muscle spindles as stretch receptors and tendon organs that monitor force generation. These are activated in the setting of an increased workload from a disease state producing an increase in airway resistance that may be associated with symptoms of the chest tightness or decreased lung or chest wall compliance such as in pulmonary fibrosis. Other afferent signals that trigger dyspnea can arise from pulmonary vascular receptor responses to changes in pulmonary artery pressure and skeletal muscle which are termed metaboreceptors and they are believed to sense changes in the biochemical environment. Efferent signals are sent from the CNS back to the respiratory muscles and they are also transmitted by the corollary discharge to the sensory cortex that are believed to underlie sensations of respiratory effort and perhaps contribute to sensations of air hunger. They are especially in response to an increased ventilatory load in a disease stage such as COPD. In addition, fear or anxiety may heighten the sense of dyspnea through exacerbating the underlying physiologic disturbance in response to an increased respiratory rate or disordered breathing pattern. Distinguishing between the myriad of underlying processes that might present with dyspnea can be challenging. A graded approach that begin with a history and physical examination, followed by a selected laboratory testing that might then advance to additional diagnostics and potentially subspecialty referral may help elucidate the underlying cause of dyspnea. It is indeed difficult to reliably measure dyspnea due to multiple relevant possible domains that can be taken into account such as sensory perceptual experience, affective distress, and symptom impact or burden. It is important to remember that there exist no uniformly agreed tools for dyspnea assessment. Consensus opinion is that dyspnea should be formally assessed in a context relevant and beneficial for a patient's management. There are a number of emerging tools that have been developed for a formal dyspnea assessment. As an example is the modified Medical Research Council dyspnea scale shown in the table and this is used to assess symptom or impact burden in COPD. For patients with a known prior pulmonary, cardiac, or neuromuscular condition and worsening dyspnea, the initial focus of the evaluation will usually address determining whether the known condition has progressed or whether a new process has developed that is causing dyspnea. For patients without prior known potential cause of dyspnea, the initial evaluation will focus on determining an underlying etiology. Determining the underlying cause, if possible, is extremely important as the treatment may vary dramatically based upon the predisposing condition. I can't emphasize enough the importance of good history. The patient should be asked to describe in his or her own words what the discomfort feels like, as well as the effects of position, 
infections, and environmental stimuli on the dyspnea as descriptors may be helpful in pointing toward an etiology. For example, symptoms of chest tightness might suggest the possibility of bronchoconstriction and the sensation of inability to take a deep breath may correlate with dynamic hyperinflation from COPD. Orthopnea is a common indicator of congestive heart failure, mechanical impairment of the diaphragm associated with obesity, or asthma triggered by esophageal reflux. Next, we determine the onset and duration. Acute, intermittent episodes of dyspnea are more likely to reflect episodes of myocardial ischemia, bronchospasm, or pulmonary embolism, while chronic, persistent dyspnea is more typical of COPD, interstitial lung disease, chronic thromboembolic disease. Information on risk factors for drug-induced or occupational lung disease and coronary artery disease should be elicited. Physical Examination Initial vital signs might be helpful in pointing towards an underlying etiology in the context of the remainder of the evaluation. For example, the presence of fever might point toward an underlying infectious or inflammatory process. The presence of hypertension in the setting of heart failure might point toward diastolic dysfunction and presence of tachycardia might be associated with many different underlying processes including fever, cardiac dysfunction, or deconditioning. And the presence of resting hypoxemia suggests processes involving hypercapnia, ventilation perfusion mismatch, shunt, or impairment in diffusion capacity might be involved. The physical examination should begin during the interview of the patient. Inability of the patient to speak in full sentences before stopping to get a deep breath suggests a condition that leads to stimulation of the controller or impairment of the ventilatory pump with reduced vital capacity. Evidence of increased work of breathing such as supraclavicular retractions and use of accessory muscles during ventilation and the tripod position characterized by sitting with the hands braced on the knees is indicative of increased airway resistance or stiffness of the lungs and the chest wall. Examination of the chest should focus on symmetry of movement, percussion wherein dullness is indicative of pleural effusion, hyperresonance is a sign of emphysema, and auscultation where wheezes and ronchi, prolonged expiratory phase and diminished breath sounds are all clues to disorders of the airways. Rails suggest interstitial edema or fibrosis. The cardiac examination should also focus on signs of elevated right heart pressure such as jugular vein distension, edema, accentuated pulmonary component of the second heart sound, and left ventricular dysfunction with S3 and S4 gallops, and valvular disease with murmurs. When examining the abdomen with a patient in supine position, the physician should note whether there is paradoxical movement as well as the presence of increased respiratory distress in the supine position. Inward motion during inspiration is a sign of diaphragmatic weakness, and routing of the abdomen during exhalation is subjective of pulmonary edema. Extremities Clubbing of the digits may be an indication of interstitial pulmonary fibrosis or bronchiectasis, and joint swelling or deformation as well as changes consistent with Raynaud's disease may be indicative of collagen vascular process that can be associated with pulmonary disease. Patients should be asked to walk under observation with oximetry in order to reproduce the symptoms. The patient should be examined during and at the end of exercise for findings that were not present at rest, such as wheezing and changes in oxygen saturation. A chest radiograph should be obtained after the history elicitation and the physical examination if diagnosis remains elusive. The lung volumes should be assessed. Hyperinflation is consistent with obstructive lung disease, whereas low lung volume suggests interstitial edema or fibrosis, diaphragmatic dysfunction, or impaired chest wall motion. The pulmonary parenchyma should be examined for evidence of interstitial disease, infiltrates, and emphysema. Prominent pulmonary vasculature in the upper zones indicates pulmonary venous hypertension, while enlarged central pulmonary arteries may suggest pulmonary arterial hypertension. An enlarged cardiac silhouette can point out towards dilated cardiomyopathy or valvular disease. Bilateral pleural effusions are typical of cardiac heart failure and sometimes may form collagen vascular disease. Unilateral effusions raise the concern of carcinoma and pulmonary embolism but may also occur in heart failure in the case of parapneumotic effusion. 
CT scan of the chest is generally reserved for further evaluation of the lung parenchyma, such as an interstitial lung disease and possible pulmonary embolism if the diagnosis remains uncertain. Laboratories Initial laboratory testing should include a hematocrit to exclude occult anemia as an underlying cause of reduced oxygen-carrying capacity contributing to dyspnea. A basic metabolic panel may be helpful to exclude a significant underlying metabolic acidosis, and conversely, an elevated bicarbonate might point towards the possibility of carbon dioxide retention that might be seen in chronic respiratory failure. In such a setting, an arterial blood gas may provide useful additional information. Additional laboratory studies should include electrocardiography to seek evidence of ventricular hypertrophy and prior myocardial infarction. Spirometry that can be diagnostic to the presence of obstructive ventilatory defect and suggest the possibility of restrictive ventilatory defect that then might prompt additional pulmonary function laboratory testing including lung volumes, diffusion capacity, and possible tests of neuromuscular function. Echocardiography is indicated when systolic dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension, or valvular heart disease is suspected. Up to one-third of patients with clinical diagnoses of asthma do not have reactive airways disease when formally tested. Measurement of brain natriuretic peptide levels in serum is increasingly used to assess cardiac heart failure in patients presenting with acute dyspnea but may be elevated in the presence of right ventricular strain as well. Now, if a patient has evidence of both pulmonary and cardiac disease that is not either responsive to treatment or remains unclear what factors are primarily driving dyspnea, a cardiopulmonary exercise test or CPET can be carried out to determine which system is responsible for the exercise limitation. If at peak exercise, the patient achieves predicted maximal ventilation, demonstrates an increase in dead space or hypoxemia, or develops bronchospasms, the respiratory system may be the cause of the problem. Alternatively, if the heart rate is greater than 85% of the predicted maximum, if the anaerobic threshold occurs early, if the blood pressure becomes excessively high or decreased during exercise, if the oxygen pulse decrease, or if there is ischemic changes of the electrocardiogram, an abnormality in the cardiovascular system is likely the explanation of the breathing discomfort. Lastly, treatment. The first goal is to correct the underlying condition and address potentially reversible causes with appropriate treatment for the particular condition. If relief of dyspnea with treatment of underlying condition is not fully possible, an effort is made to lessen the intensity of the symptoms and its effects of the patient's quality of life. Supplemental oxygen should be administered if the resting oxygen saturation is less than or equal to 88%, or if the patient's saturation drops of these levels with activity or sleep. Pulmonary rehabilitation programs have demonstrated positive effects of dyspnea, exercise capacity, and rates of hospitalization. Opioids have been shown to reduce symptoms of dyspnea, largely through reducing air hunger, thus likely suppressing respiratory drive and influencing cortical activity. However, Opioids should be considered for each patient individually based upon the risk-benefit profile as regards with the effects of respiratory depression. Studies of anxiolytics for dyspnea have not demonstrated consistent benefit. Additional approaches are under study for dyspnea, including inhaled furosemide that might alter afferent sensory information. And these are my references. Follow me for more videos on JM's Insta Adios!